Okay, so last night a few of us got together and we brainstormed some ideas that we thought we might want to talk about towards the end of the conference. So, one of the questions that the historians asked us was, was it valuable for astronomers to hear the historian's point of view? Because we heard that some astronomers, I think we heard that Don Osterbrock might not have always like the astronomer's point of view. I don't know. What, what do people Story, say? Stories. I think it's very, it's very useful. I mean, I've been working on the Richard question for between 30 and 40 years. And I have found this extremely useful to know what the beginnings of some of the Richard's work was. Of course, I've always acknowledged best of slavery. I've always known him since the beginning because I worked here at Lowell, at Lowell Observatory for three years as an astronomer. But the, uh, I think there is no answer to these things, as we've heard several times. It takes a synthesis of many people and many ideas. The historians, I hope, are the ones who get it right. I don't think the scientists ever will. <laughs> uh, Greg? Yeah, I, I think this is valuable because all of the scientists are a lot more narrow-minded in real life than we pretend. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and it's really useful. You mature as a scientist when you develop an appreciation for the connectivity of ideas and the transmission of knowledge and the uh, collaborative enterprise that it takes to produce a result that's usually credited to a single individual. But when you know the history behind it, you actually feel less obscure as a scientist and you feel like you're making a contribution. So if these kinds of things are useful. It should be a little bit more wide scale. So more narrow-minded scientists could you know, open up a little bit. Chris, you have a um, Yeah, no, I agree with Greg, and I, I definitely agree with this statement. And, and I think the research astronomers here really benefited from all the discussion. A, a, a less maybe pejorative way of putting it in terms of the research scientists is that it's a very, you know, to get a job in professional astronomy during research, it's extremely competitive, it's hard, and people at the level of graduate students are expected to be world experts on something. That's essentially what you're told when you do a thesis. And so, uh, you know, the trend to narrowness in science, which is owned by astronomers and geneticists that have their own version of it and so on, is, is part of a culture, you know, the culture of doing research in academia. It, it's very hard to draw back from it, and most students are not advised to make themselves familiar with a broader literature. They just have to ratchet themselves up to the frothy edge of frontier of knowledge as fast as they possibly can, carve out a problem that's theirs alone, and be the best at that. And there's not a lot of rear view mirror involved in doing that. And there's not a lot of context. And so people make mistakes. You know, scientists, research scientists make mistakes out of ignorance of the literature, not just the sort of snubbing of a previous generation of pioneers. It can be more profound and worse than that. Can affect the progress of the field. So I think this is a kind of very important corrective measure to have more scientists hearing historians and philosophers' uh, points of views. Fred? Well, just to add one thing to that, um, one of the most important things for us to do, I think, especially once we're sort of established, is we get to decide what problem to work on next. You know, what do we actually do to optimize our scientific productivity, both in terms of grant dollars and everything else. And looking at the historical perspective of how history plays out, I think, informs what choices we should make. So that is actually a, another interesting aspect of this exercise. Yeah, speaking as a amateur astronomer and a former professional geneticist, a molecular biologist, I discovered in my career when I was a graduate student, my supervisor insisted that we do a massive literature review of everything that preceded. And we're talking the Stone Age here in the 70s. Uh, and it was then possible to do that. Uh, today, you know, the half-life of a paper in molecular biology is about three years because of the sheer number and the rapid advances. And so if you have a graduate student and you want that person to succeed, you're going to put them on a rapidly focused topic that will quickly yield results and papers so that they can then move on in their careers. That almost forces them to be narrow-minded. And I think 
there a historical perspective, like a thorough literature review, at least when you write that thesis, or conferences like this are very useful because it's so easy to think you've discovered something and only to learn that five years ago somebody else had already and you've never cited them. So but that's presu presumably something that would really come out in a specialist conference, would it, would it not, rather than this one here? Well, and possibly, but also I think, uh, you know, to give students today who think you go online and you find everything you need very quickly, uh, to give them a s historical sense that you know you're sort of standing on the shoulder, not necessarily of giants, but a whole bunch of other people, will provide a continuity that I think, as scientists, they do need to be aware. Of. And perhaps this kind of kind of meeting or something like it can be very helpful in that regard. I think I disagree. <coughs> so we are a great so I've, 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 I've had a great time uh, finding myself wondering why is it that I'm in this in my 50s, the way I want it in my 20s. And the answer is, as, as a young scientist, it's maybe unhelpful to know too much about what's been done. You know, as a quote, I forget who it's due to, but you know, young scientists not knowing what's possible, not knowing that certain things are impossible, get on and do them anyway. Right? So when, when you're getting into the subject, it's probably a good thing. Obviously, you've got to know literature to an extent of knowing what's out there. Otherwise, probably the less you know about how it got to be like that, the better. You should just get on, remake the subjects. Because yeah, that's what young people do. They throw away the past. They don't care. By okay, so, so we should change the subject. Uh, all. Yeah. All. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs>
astronomers who are looking at the historical issues, for example, I found particularly interesting John Ned <coughs> page looking at Vienna Slaver from different perspectives. I thought that was very valuable. And I, you know, if I had heard those before I'd given my own talk, I'd have come up with a slightly different talk, I think, and trying to put emphasis, and I think I would have had a sh sharper account in various sections of it. So I thought that was an extremely valuable thing for me as a historian. Any other historians want to? Well, I'm not a historian, but I was going to say that I think it is valuable. When I was studying physics as a young student, many questions I had about the material, conservation of charge or whatever it was, how did people come up with this? This seems so strange. But when later, when I read original papers, I found out, oh, they had the same questions. I think presenting a more historically accurate picture of the development of, say, electricity and magnetism when you're teaching the young student can help them learn the subject better. I know I learned best in school in the context of understanding a lot of my subjects. How about a younger person over here? <laughs> <laughs> Someone that, that's at the very beginning of astronomy. Um, I think this, uh, the historical context, sure, it doesn't help me learn how to use the metric in any different way, but it does help me understand and actually learn it for the first time. Uh, and actually have it stick in my head uh, other than for, from a class or something like that. So in that sense, I really appreciated everything I learned here and I, I took notes that are gonna help me with my class. So that's okay. Uh, Ari? Uh, I, I believe that uh, the answer uh, to this question should be pointed, means uh, to, to give concrete uh, fact which uh, I learned or someone else learned uh, from this meeting. And uh, just uh, uh, five uh, minutes ago, uh, uh, John Peacock uh, said that he appreciated uh, my lecture because I uh, um, explained that uh, Friedman was the first who um, um, uh, described this hyperbolic uh, uh, negative curvature um, uh, universe. Well, not just the first, the only. And, and so the only. That wasn't independently rediscovered until... Uh, right, <coughs> and, and, and this, in fact, uh, this like uh, took out a, a uh, biblical uh, expression uh, from the eyes of um, uh, uh, other uh, scientists. I, I do believe that the uh, uh, idea of flat universe would not come in uh, mind for 10, 20, 30 years more unless uh, only because uh, Friedman uh, made it uh, a negative uh, curvature and flat uh, curvature, uh, flat universe would be also possible mm -hmm. in the eyes of Einstein and uh, the sitter. So this uh, a fact, uh, just particular fact, which uh, an astronomer could learn from a historian. And uh, now my own experience, uh, which fact I uh, learned, uh, and I believe it's um, explained to me much. Um, again, I'm a bit concerned that uh, people talking about priorities, they concentrate just on this small passage in the matter, uh, which was deleted in his English translation, 19. Uh, 31. And this became like a pilot uh, point right now of all the discussions about priority, which is absolutely misplaced in my um, opinion. But I got an idea why uh, Lemaitre deleted it um, uh, after I heard uh, someone stop uh, uh, with uh, a couple data for um, uh, which obtained by uh, uh, Humazon. Uh, this uh, uh, two points which were below, uh, beyond 20 uh, megaparsec, 20 and 30. And um, I, I, I think Lemaitre, who uh, saw this two new point, which in fact made, for those who know what is uh, regression analysis, understand that two outliers uh, uh, will make immediately a straight line just because they are uh, over there. And uh, Le what Lemaitre had is a small piece of data uh, in the corner. So he realized that uh, these two points are much more important than all his arguments with, uh, even with 41 galaxies, but cornered in, uh, near the um, uh, beginning of coordinates. So for me, this uh, was an answer to the uh, question which is uh, hotly debated uh, uh, in this conference in particular, uh, and uh, which again, I believe is absolutely uh, inflated in significance. But the answer is came from this particular talk of uh, an astronomer. Great. Greg? Yeah, I just want to say that 
So a conference like this, so I like to teach history of philosophy of science from the point of view that ambiguous data supports all viewpoints. And uh, sorting that process out is sort of, you know, what this was about. I mean, who's going to get credit for discovering the universe based on a limited amount of redshifts and without a theoretical framework? I just find that introducing that to students and helping them think about it is the best way to instill principles of scientific literacy that I can think of. And so these kinds of things are very valuable. So, you know, I have a nice module on the Shapley Curtis debate. Now, from everything, I could put together a module on, you know, well, galaxy redshifts, 1912, what do we do with them? Let the student think about it. So and these kinds of things really inform someone like me. Okay. And just on your question, I mean, this has been an extremely valuable conference, I think, for a lot of people. But, but I would say I would worry about, you know, we have two communities apparently. One is astronomers on the left, one left hand side, and then on the right hand side we have the historians. You know, and I, I worry about that for two reasons. First of all, as, as was pointed out earlier, I think it's an enormous benefit for any scientist to know the history of their subject, at least the basics. It really helps them, I think, in their careers and just in their whole <coughs> approach. To the, that, that's the real philosophy of science, I think, is to understand how things were found out. But the second thing is, you know, <laughs> it really struck me this weekend that you know, historians of astronomy are obviously a very, you're quite a special breed. Because first of all, you all know a lot about astronomy. <laughs> That's not a given. You know, it really isn't. I, I think as historians of astronomy, you're all you know you, you know this field backwards. So that's how you can do what you do. But you know, I don't. I mean, I can't speak for the states because I'm not from here. But some of you may know there's a new generation now in the history of science where that history has actually been written by people who are absolutely trained, well-trained historians, but they're not scientists. In fact, they have no training at all in science. And that that happens quite a lot. And I think that's creating its own problems because while they do bring something to the table, to use that awful expression, they often have a rather peculiar viewpoint, I think, and that's because they simply can't quite understand, for example, the primary sources. They go to read a paper and they can't understand the paper. And if you think, for example, of the analysis John Peacock presented, now that's a slightly different case because I know there's lots of astronomers here and historians here who do that, but what I mean is that that kind of specialized thing, you know, or somebody, how could you write a book on, gay, on the history of gay symmetry if you're not actually that level of a theoretician? So I think the, 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 the split that we've kind of seen happen over the years between the discipline of a historian versus the discipline of a practitioner, be it an astronomer or a scientist, I think if anything, I, I disagree with John, I, I, would, I think we should be undoing that split actually rather, rather than, than allowing it to widen. Good, good. We have some disagreement. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have um, kind of follow up to that because I started my undergrad in astronomy and I'm looking at the history now, so that's why I enjoy things like this. Um, because I, you know, I always use examples. If you're studying Russian history, it helps if you know Russian. If you're studying history of science, it helps if you know science. So it helps me, it's like maintaining a language that I know. I continue to talk to astronomers um, and really maintain that. And then on a different level, when I look at, you know, multi split technology, I'm like, okay, that'll be what I'll write about. So this is kind of helping on both sides. Like, so I, I, just, I wanted to uh, uh, basically make a complaint about historians of science, partially borne out by this conference, and mostly, but mostly not. Uh, astronomy, of course, is a very popular subject among college students. I mean, a third or so of college students at, at my university take astronomy at some point very popular, and one of the things that I find uh, you know, vital to uh, make the class come alive is to tell stories. Um, it's not the only way to teach it, but I find it's a, it's a big asset to me. Even though I, uh, you know, I have a reasonable pedigree in history of science, I studied with Owen as an undergraduate, Gerald Holton. Uh, nevertheless, when, when I uh, talk about the scientific revolution, for example, uh, my stories are basically those of Bertolt Brecht and Arthur Kessler. And the first one is outright fiction, and the second one is uh, considered by many historians of science to be pretty close to fiction as well. Um, and, but one of the things that I, so, you know, I, I know that it's, I feel bad about this, but year after year I keep doing it because the stories are good. Now, historians of science are generally pretty good writers, but they generally don't write things for the public. I, I would eat them up if they did. Uh, any 
any historians of science want to take that one? Oh, you're absolutely right. And the reason is if when you write for the public, you don't get tenure for that. <laughs> well, you already got tenure, man. That's right. So now I can write. We'll be talking after this. That's it. It's a question of professional credit. And you get professional credit for publishing in obscure journals and writing books that nobody reads. Um, it's unfortunate. Okay. I would, uh, I mean, I would echo that and say, if we looking around at the books that inspired me by the way they were written, flesh out the stories of the people, they were often by Timothy Ferris, trained as a journalist, as they were so well. They were, they were often not by historians of science. I, I, I agree with you. I would have liked to have the total experts' view on that story on that subject. And, and, and of course, it's even worse when, when our, our source is actual astronomy texts who have, you know, pay lip service to history, but as many historians of science have told me, that's absolutely true, when professional astronomers write on history, um, it's basic, they're basically amateurs. There's a few exceptions to that. In fact, there are definitely some in this room. Outside of this room, there's not that many exceptions. <laughs> Should we move on to another? That's a big one. That's a big one. They're not all that big. Oh, oh, David, 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 yeah. yeah I want okay, to respond to what Bobo is, is here. I was looking for Bobo <laughs> up there, and maybe you're here. Uh, one of the first books I wrote um, uh, was a, a straight astronomy textbook, uh, basically introduction to astronomy using a planetarium. And um, Owen was one of the ones who reviewed it, and he doesn't remember. <laughs> Which is safe. Now I can tell any story I want. <laughs> but the fact was, uh, I had come up with something which I admit was based upon my readings of George A. Bell's Exploration of the Universe for arguing for why Tycho, how Tycho searched for parallax and, and didn't find it. Owen uh, wrote me and was. Um, uh, quite puzzled and was wondering if I had discovered a new uh, historical tidbit that nobody knew about because that certainly wasn't, uh, you know, it actually made sense, but it was a post hoc astronomical uh, rationalization of, of, of a historical event, which I never looked at the original literature or anything of at that time. This was a while ago. So that was a very important lesson to me. And I think Owen was the first. To, to make me aware of the fact that uh, there is a history of astronomy uh, as presented by astronomers. And it tells you more about the astronomers themselves and how they view their history, which is fine, than it does about the history. But if you take the effort to want to know the history yourself, you have to go beyond uh, the contemporary literature. Now, it, it, I mean, in answer to you, um, I would. I, I was in the same boat. I mean, Bertolt Brecht and Kessler. Uh, I used. I used those in courses when I used to teach astronomy, and uh, we simply pointed out that this is how the uh, these historical eras, these very important events, entered the popular literature and how they're treated by it. And one way I found was that if there's anybody in the class who wanted to make the effort to read. Uh, a little deeper and a little broader, it was up to them to do it and they could get extra credit. I mean, try that next time. <laughs> yeah, it'll be really successful. <coughs> shall, we, shall we try to move on? We have like a whole bunch of things. Why don't we try yeah, that, was a big, that was the biggest one by far, yes, though. I think so. So these are things we've already discussed. So apportioning credit, we've already talked about that a bit, uh, how we apportion credit for various things. This apportioning credit, it's, you know, it's not just who did it first and so on, but Hubble is probably a very typical example. Suddenly, everything that was discovered was shuffled on him. He discovered about everything. And then, of course, politics kept coming as well. And when we do, when we do uh, history of science, we actually want to understand how things evolved, how, how those before us, how they worked, what kind, how did they deal with their problems? And then you made the point, of course, well, also others made the point, uh, it wasn't just Le <coughs> on his own who, who did everything. And 
course, certainly not Hubble who did everything. So uh, apportioning is not just the matter that the right person gets the right credit, but to understand how different people did different, uh, uh, made different contributions and how this uh, became a new uh, picture of the world. So uh, I wouldn't underrate that, nor overrate it. As I recall, it, this item got written down on the list because of arguing that actually what we're trying to do here is to some extent an anti-historical exercise. So uh, professional astronomers, professionals in any field, I guess, <coughs> once they get old enough, they spend half their lives writing, writing or reading letters of recommendation. You're forever saying, X is really good, they did this great piece of work, you should hire them, and so on. And so, from, from my point of view, it's almost a question of belatedly uh, doing what should have been done for the slider at the time. And these kind of just-so stories in this, you find in the history, are as much of a myth as the ones we make up in the profession day to day, probably. I think it's the same phenomenon. But to, to make sense of the world, you've got to hang an exaggerated account of somebody's achievements around their neck, otherwise they wouldn't get anywhere. One point of view. <laughs> this will be this first thing. Paul, oh, I, I suppose this is a question I have for the historians of science, because I think this is probably something that most people are probably most important things to historians of science do, which is not simply figuring out who did what at first, like Friedman published his paper in 1922, but how do you measure influence? For example, if you want to know to what extent if any Friedman's papers influenced people at this time thinking about it. Sometimes it's pretty clear because you look at citations and look at people and you can say, oh yeah, clearly the same. But other times it's not so clear. So I'm just curious how the historians go about doing that. Go ahead, Ari. It's yours. Um, <laughs> yeah, fortunately I, I, I am next, right, in line and I can, uh, I, I, I want to answer your question, right. Uh, I, it seems to me here a disagreement. It's about the nature of consensus between me and Harry. Ari is saying that Friedman was out of the debate uh, uh, 20s and 30s, which uh, uh, allegedly shaped the view how to discuss and what is proven and what is not yet and what should be more done. Uh, and uh, I believe that 20s and 30s is decisive for this um, uh, uh, acceptance of uh, expansion. And I don't believe so. I do believe that uh, uh, Lemaitre and Hubble, those people who decided to be in, in, in a final race uh, by uh, modern historians, they just, they're guilty of misleading, in fact, um, uh, many of them, um, many uh, 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 people who uh, played that game because underestimating uh, age of universe uh, brought to a stalemate it was a stalemate. Einstein was despair to find the truth. Because from uh, Hubble's and Lemaitre's computations, it came 1.7 billion years. And uh, Earth was already established as uh, to be uh, four or five uh, billion years old. So it was absolutely non clear from where a problem comes. And Einstein even stopped to think uh, about uh, cosmology. He just humbly insisted that his theory is correct. And uh, uh, parameters might be uh, discussed further in, in the uh, same um, book which I uh, mentioned in, in this appendix on cosmological problem. So I do believe that uh, 20s and 30s not only didn't add anything to, um, uh, to the whole debate, but just threw people back. And, uh, uh, and Friedman was rediscovered somewhere in the 60s when um, uh, uh, Soviet uh, uh, major physicist uh, voiced, uh, uh, the, uh, raised their voice. Uh, uh, Kapitza, Zildovich, um, uh, Fox said to some extent uh, uh, about that. But they constantly and repeatedly said that. They, for example, Kapitza said Dirac uh, didn't believe in positron uh, uh, because some people said, uh, quoting Fox, they said that uh, um, Friedman didn't believe in expanding. He just said, okay, this is mathematical model and let physicists treat it further. And because of that, uh, allegedly, uh, Friedman didn't believe in his own theory. 
because of that, uh, he should not be given um, um, uh, all credit. And uh, Capitza uh, uh, said that it's nonsense. Dirac uh, didn't believe in positron. And Capitza knows this uh, personally. He says, I, I, I just quote what, what he wrote. And no one denies uh, Dirac to be a discoverer of positron. This is okay. one point. Okay, okay. But Let's uh, try to stay focused. <laughs> Continue. Uh, I do believe that uh, 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 Nobel Prize uh, uh, people just started from the point where Friedman left. Okay, that's uh, all what you, that's all the 20s and for. 30s were irrelevant <coughs> for. Okay, they, they brought new theories, as you know, uh, the steady state theory, other stuff. Lemaitre had to, it's clear why he was embarrassed to be, um, um, uh, to, uh, to hear the talk by uh, the Pope, because uh, he had to, he was in a peculiar situation when uh, cosmology was uh, in uh, inner contradiction. He didn't know how to get around that. He was embarrassed that Pope refers to this theory as established, while uh, he didn't believe uh, himself that uh, uh, everything was resolved there. Yeah, Chris? Um, yeah, I, my opinion is that I think a, a forcing credit is, is just a strange post hoc way of declaring winners and losers may, you know, may make us feel good. But it, what's more interesting to me out of this meeting is uh, just to see how early in any subject, or maybe at any point in any subject, what really matters is what the, the network of people is. That many of these were point-to-point -point relationships or very small groups before the age of instant communication. So the whole idea of consensus and how that was achieved when people were either solitons sometimes or working in complete, in very complete dialogue between the other major thinkers was important. And then the other thing that is pointed out very clearly, and John had told this in his talk, was how, you know, some to us, again, with that wonderful post hoc hindsight, the evidence is staring you in the face. And so what is the toolkit you need as a scientist in the moment with what you have available to you, your culture, your collaboration, your connection, that lets you see something or not see something or take a bold step or yes. not take a bold step. What's the group thing involved? Because although it's a different age a hundred years ago, you could flash forward to now where the physics community is goes through paroxysms about string theory and whether an entire generation has been lost to something that is undemonstrable empirically. And astronomers are of course locked into a paradigm they like an awful lot where the two major components of the universe are extremely elusive. So these are uncomfortable, but now it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise. It's not, it's not a dozen or two dozen people who don't always talk to each other. So that's pretty interesting. Maybe the same thing is going on, just scaled up. Here, here. Can I just follow up the general question about influence? Because I think one of the key things for the historians would be not just rely on the published materials, but to try and get uh, the issue that was raised about networks, so to understand how information is flowing in letters, how the informal contacts, who is listened, who is taken seriously, all those kinds of things can often be gotten from <coughs> the archives in a way that you just can't get at them from the published paper. So often uh, the historians are off grinding out uh, information out of the archives, I think. And part of the reason is, is exactly that, that you, you just can't, the, the scientific papers tend to be the tip of the iceberg for certain kinds of issues. We got about a half hour more, I think. Really? <coughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so we have some other questions here, so let's move on. Oh. Uh, let's get through a few things, otherwise we're I mean, I know everyone wants to thrash everything out to the very end, but we'll never solve every problem. Um, how about this? Can astronomers handle nuance in their founding myths and future discoveries? I don't even know what nuance is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. We didn't think so. Over. That's a French word. <laughs> well, it, it, it's like, a, uh, how many people can you assign a discovery to? Ah, Nobel Prize. How people. many names can you put on the space telescope? Three, three people. We call up the flight to the center, one, 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 yeah. Yeah. More of that, we probably don't even care about. I guess it should yeah. be better. I don't care about nuance. I should, but I don't. 
you, you might not, but so, but <laughs> new one, I mean, the, the question you know, is, about you. oh, well, I, I'd rather hear what other people have to say. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that this is the same thing. Can any field, can anyone handle this nuance? In there? And I think we, we know that it's difficult for every field to handle it because you've got to teach people what the, what the past was. And it's much easier, I think, as I said in my talk, these linear histories are so effective, uh, people just don't want to spend the energy to teach the full picture, right? It takes too long. If you give Nobel Prizes, you don't have nuance because you can only give it to three people, right? Yeah, that's, and that's a major problem. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Right. Well, Unless the United AAS Nations. The prizes are similar. <laughs> What's that? The AAAS prizes are, I mean, there's at least one prize that you can only give to one person or a couple of people, even if there's a whole team involved. You cannot give it to one. And just on that, um, first of all, th th this thing of founding myths, for me, you know, let's not overdo it. Um, in my response to Robert and Harry says the same in his introduction. Yes, I, I, of course the papers don't tell the whole story, but they're a hell of a good start. I mean, I think we should never lose sight of the fact that ever since the Royal Society was formed, science has this wonderful literature where when people think they've established something, they actually do write it down and it's tightly controlled, etc. It's an awful lot of fields of human activity that don't have that at all. And, you know, just for once, because we weren't supposed to be, what's the word then? Um, try and you know, be a little bit controversial. I'm going to put it to all of you. If you think of the original Hubble graph, the original one that we've been debating, I think science is linear. I think it's linear exactly like that graph. Not every point lies on the line. Of course it doesn't. It's all over the place. But it still does reasonably progress from one thing to another. And I think, now I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but again, <laughs> well, first of all, the history, historians of astronomy are different. As you just said yourself, you taught us history. You taught us something. Well, that's a completely different thing. I know historians of science who have never sat a class in science. Now, I'm not talking about the United States. Maybe it's different here. Yeah, but we're, we're not a monolithic group. Oh, yeah, no, okay. Far, far. Right, yeah. But is, <laughs> but can I just ask, is there any historian of science here who's, who really has actually never looked through a telescope, for example? One. Yesterday. Of the same I, order. I, I wonder, I just get the feeling all the time there's this kind of inward knocking of science all the time. And I think I don't think it's as random as all that at all. You know, I, I think it is reasonably linear. And I think these what, what gets confused with the whole thing is professional historians don't talk to the public much. An awful lot of scientists, we have to do that. And just to add to the mix, here's what I'm interested in. I'm not so interested in about the whole consensus of science about who discovered what. I'm far more interested in things the next step, and we haven't talked about that, so I hope you have something on it, is when something's agreed in the scientific community, it doesn't always get into society. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And that's a very big question, especially when something serious like global warming comes along. And you know, that's that's really what I was I was hoping to hear a little bit about. But anyway. You gotta be careful which Pandora's boxes we open. Yeah. <laughs> I know theoretical astronomers who've never looked through a telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so don't come down on this story. But again, I think that uh, we need to be able to Can't be a Because uh, there is, I mean, uh, we heard it throughout the, the meeting today, both, both sides of the, of the question. Uh, almost everyone recognizes that the, the, the history is complex, and yet you still argue over this astronomer doesn't get a proper credit, that doesn't get a proper credit, and none of us have the time, the wherewithal, or the presence of mind to simply say, well, there is 
you know, if there is a master narrative, let's collectively decide what it is, and it's not simple. That's, I mean, because we're faced with, as Deidre says, you know, what did you discover today? Now, Fred, you had your hand up. No, I'd like to go back to that point, because I think it's really important that you communicate to, not the people in this room, but to the people of the whole country, how the scientific method works. Because one, there's a lot of noise from the social construct folk about the scientific method varies whether a man does it or a woman does it, and a lot of kind of nonsense like that. And we need to educate them. There are you know, it's 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 really is about that. And I don't think that's serving us well, but also more to the point, we need to educate the public so that there is continued public funding for science and education. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but about 20 years ago, some of the people at NSF decided we only want to up fund results-oriented science. We only want to fund the, the science that's going to work. And what people don't understand is that you need this whole scientific community to be working, and then one guy that is going to be the lucky one who wins the Nobel Prize or makes or gets credit for the discovery, but all of us have to be working so that one of us gets that next step forward. And this communication of how the scientific method works is very important, and I, I think that if that's what you mean by getting the nuance out to the public, I think that's very important. It, it is. I mean, your point, I hate to say it, but you just raised a sociological issue. <laughs> and that is, you know, where you get your money from, what do your patrons expect? And as that changes, science, the practice of science changes. But the way the scientific method and scientific discovery move forward doesn't. The universe is still the same way, no matter who's paying for it. The universe, <laughs> may be, the universe may be the same way, but the but the techniques through it that you apply or are allowed to apply to find them out do change and are subject to technology, patronage, time, you know, the nature of your position, who's employing you, all of those social elements factor into uh, how discoveries are made. And I know that, that that gets close to Harry Collins, that close to, you know, that's about as close as I'll get to Harry Collins and people <laughs> like that. But I do respect that there is important elements of that to, to consider. I mean, look, 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 at, look at Leviathan in the air pump. That's uh, Chapin and, and you, <laughs> I hate you hate the book because it tells you that, that over time, scientists, people who would be scientists, accept different forms of evidence as authority. Look at Galileo. Images as authority, images as evidence. That was a new idea. You don't understand modern science without knowing that. And in the case of Chapin and, and Schaffer, it is the authority that comes through an experiment. It's the recognition of that. That is a fundamental shift in how science is done. It is that you, you don't deal with rhetoric, you deal with evidence. And, you know, I can't think of anything more profound. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to just make a quick observation. I, I agree with you and with you. There is a major sociological thing in modern science because it's, to a large extent, money-driven, and that means competition for grants, competition to get papers published, review boards that may not like the paradigm you're trying to propose and get a paper on, et cetera. That is a science management problem that scientists have to deal with. On the other hand, if we do not, as, as Deidre said, communicate how science actually works to the public at large, we're gonna lose an awful lot of the perspective that the public has. And to be too nuanced there is a two-edged sword. Yeah. If we say the Hubble Space Telescope is named after Hubble because he discovered the expansion of the universe, people go, oh, great, he was a great man. But if we say, well, actually, he, you know, maybe he cheated a little, and maybe there should be five or six others, and it should be the blah, 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 blah Space Telescope, they're going to lose interest, and they're going to say, you guys are all a bunch of crooks. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a subtle difference that in yes. terms of how you sell science to the public and then how we conduct science among scientists. That's the nuance. Good point. That's really the nuance. Public demands heroes. 
Joe. Where does the public get its information about science? <coughs> the same place college students do, Wikipedia. And I have in front of me the oh. entry on Edwin Powell Hubble. Has anyone looked at that lately? Hey, let's end it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Edward Paul Hubble was an American astronomer who played a crucial role in establishing the field of extragalactic astronomy and is generally regarded as one of the most important observational cosmologists of the 20th century. Hubble is generally mistakenly known for Lemaitre's law, or Hubble's law, which was discovered by George Lemaitre. He is also mistakenly credited with the discovery of the existence of galaxies other than the Milky Way and his galactic redshift discovery that the loss in frequency, the redshift, observed in the spectra of light from other galaxies increased in proportion to a particular galaxy's distance from Earth. This relationship became known as Lemaitre's Law or Hubble's Law. These feelings fundamentally changed the scientific view of the universe. The existence of other galaxies and redshift was actually first discovered by the American astronomer Vesto Slutter. <laughs> Using the data collected by Vesto <laughs> Slutter and his Hubble's assistant Milton Humason, a former mule driver and janitor, Hubble and Emerson found a direct relationship between a galaxy's distance and the relative, its relative speed away from the solar system. Hubble supported the Doppler shift interpretation of the observed redshift that had been proposed earlier by Vesto Slipher, and that led to the theory of the metric expansion of space. He tended to believe the frequency of any beam of light could, by some so far unknown means, be diminished ever stronger the longer the beam travels through space. So Joe, the important question is, what are the sources they're citing for all of that? I have no idea. Possession is no. nine tenths of the law. <laughs> <laughs> all of that stuff should have footnotes at the bottom. But there are footnotes here. No. All this unclear who wrote. Joe, should we move on to some? Yeah, we should. Uh, I'm gonna keep with this. Uh, Larry has. Larry's got a point. Uh, well, I just want to comment on on this. Uh, statement, what is the public going to uh, feel when they learn that Hubble uh, wasn't so so honest? Uh, I think the public, public does know, and I think the public uh, is sort of, they read Wikipedia, they, if they want to be informed, they know. And I think the mistake is on the part of the astronomer who don't have the courage to step forward and change the name and to, uh, or use the proper name political decision within the astronomy community as to who to name these, these things for. And it's done on the basis of money and influence and who is uh, at the best observatories and so on. And I don't think the public is so ignorant. They cared about Pluto. Yeah. <laughs> really, they cared. Yeah, that's about right. And, and no. they cared about Pluto because they knew anything about outer solar system objects? Of course wow. not. They cared about it because they learned it in second grade. That's and right. They learn in second grade no, because of this Disney stock. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's let's move on to something else because uh, we don't have that much more time. In about 15 minutes. Joe, ten is one of the wants to go up and have some dinner and take off. Um, so let's get to the heart of the matter. Yeah. What if anything was missing from the historical papers or from this conference? I mean, tell us what you think. What you know? If we do this again in the future, what could we improve? Should we kick some people out or let more people in? Or, you know, what, what, what do you think? Let's start with John. Well, well, one thing that wasn't quite missing, that almost got missed, was it was just squeezed in right at the end in your talk, which is a fantastic point, which is this, what did you call it, the inevitable hero? Yes. We spent this all the time here talking about who was greatest. And I think that point, that all of this would have happened anyway, whether Slifer had been born at about the right time, is something we should bear in mind. And I'm surprised more people didn't emphasize it, but coming back to where we were before, if you're informing the public, this whole idea of heroes should be done away with. You know, there's lots of smart people out there. You know, ideas have their time of ripeness, and almost inevitably they happen. I think I'm, I'm gonna be a, a, a winner of Stiegler's Law of Economy. <laughs> Greg. What I found uh, annoying about not just confident about, but Slifer's papers is he doesn't ever discuss how he chose his sample. 
and he doesn't ever list galaxies he looked at but never got a spectra of. So there's a huge selection effect. It's similar to making an HR diagram of the 20 brightest stars in the galaxy. Right? He did exactly the same thing. And that's sort of a, a major deal. And it's just, there's not enough details. I mean, you can celebrate his terse writing style, but you know, if I want to understand his statistics and his approach to this survey, this is what it is, it's a survey of galaxy redshifts, there's not enough information for me to ca calculate a selection effect and go, yeah, he could have got the right answer, you know, if he'd done it slightly differently. So that was, you know. That was well, like I mean, this point. goes back to this Lunmark 1924 paper I mentioned, where he does look at everything, and he doesn't find anything, and he tells you. No, he looks at everything that has a redshift. Everything that he could yeah, get, yeah. all the data he could get his hands on. Yeah. Well, he was banned from Mount Wilson, but. Yes. We should have invited Slifer, of course. But then I got to thinking, where is he? Where is he? Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Can you say a little bit more? Where is he buried? In Flagstaff? Is he here? Yeah, I think he's right here. Yeah. I think that's what it said. So what, was she going to do a seance? Is that going to Wikipedia. He's buried in Citizen Cemetery, Flagstaff. Citizen Cemetery in Flagstaff. Okay, that's about four or five blocks. Okay, more on the left. Joe had his hand up quite early. Joe, what, what do you think? What was missing in this conference was a scholar of Hubble, someone who was familiar with Hubble's work. We, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. That was an unfortunate. We definitely have a scho scholar of Friedman, that is very clear. We have scholars of, of the math here, but we don't have a scholar of Hubble. That's unfortunate. I agree. I'm not sure there is one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot of people have looked at Hubble, right? I think that um, the number of people who've written papers on uh, the astronomy event in Hubble, many of them are actually in the room. I don't know anybody. I mean, the late Lawrence Hetherington wrote guided tech to Hubble studies, for example. But I'm not sure I can do anybody right now. Um, Certainly, a professional historian who uh, is not in this room. All right. Well, there so aren't many of us. That's right. Maybe <laughs> other than Alka. I'm not sure who else. Rare breed. I, I don't think. I don't think we can converge. I think we've been no. to that. <laughs> I mean, but there's a, there is a popular one, obviously, Marcia Bartusia, mm -hmm. in her account, because I spent quite a bit of time arguing with her on some of the things, because she sides, in my view, with, with Hubble too much, for example. But she, uh, she's writing, obviously, a different sort we of We tried to get her to come, by the way. Yeah. Oh, Joe yeah. tried to come. Oh, Marcia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, she was, she was planning to come. That's too bad. Yeah, that's too bad. About the convergence, I'd say uh, we are talking. I, I feel a real commonality of, of, I mean, last night was great, you know. That was a very interesting, uh, exercise coming up with some of these themes and, and just listening to you guys uh, talk among yourselves uh, about the astronomy you do. I don't get to do that too often. And that was very valuable. Ari, do you have an opposing opinion about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, this reminded me uh, could we come to a consensus? Means that you, uh, your questions kind of converge also to uh, a certain point perspective. So uh, my answer is no, uh, and um, uh, why? Uh, because uh, there are, uh, uh, for example, there are experimentalists and the theorists, uh, as uh, uh, Cormac uh, several times uh, insisted on that. And uh, I, for example, I, I read paper by Perlmutter, and for him, expanding is due to Hubble. Uh, and I, I believe uh, all this would be uh, due to Hubble. Uh, maybe he will switch to Slifer, or will share between them this honor, but n never to um, uh, deliver it to Limeter or uh, Friedman, say, to Thierry's. And uh, this is one uh, 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 plane of partition. And second plane of partition is geography, because I see that uh, this revolution, this what Joe uh, uh, read I in public, this was written, I believe, just in last uh, one or two years. Before, it, it would be written completely the opposite uh, uh, essay about Hubble. It's just a revolution which happened around um, uh, Harris Newsbaumer's uh, book, uh, which uh, made a revolution, in fact, in uh, many minds. 
and uh, why, uh, and also um, uh, important scholar uh, Kra, uh, Danish scholar. I see here a European revolution against uh, uh, American uh, predominance in science. So Lemaitre put instead of uh, Hubble in the first place. And as you uh, observe, uh, uh, a scholar of Friedman is originally Russian as well. Uh, so, uh, and the Russians, only Soviet uh, physicists, uh, constantly, continuously repeated that Friedman uh, has a share in this matter, and they were not heard. Until 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, Friedman was just uh, barred from the discussion. Later, he was given uh, just equations, appeared two equations, didn't have name, or uh, was given Friedman's name to these equations. It was like a lucky situation. But Friedman was out of the debate for a long time. So what I'm saying that there is geographical division is um, it's appeared to be al almost unsurmountable. Geopolitical. European scholars <coughs> placed forward uh, uh, Limeter, uh, Russian scholar Friedman, and uh, uh, Americans uh, think uh, between Hubble and Zweig. No longer. I don't know if it's so. Uh, I mean, I, I like the idea. I'm not sure that. I think there's more nuance than that. I think there are many people here who do celebrate Friedman and many people here who do celebrate the math. I'm American. I like the math. What he said. And, and those papers of Friedman, when they were translated into English, I was very good because my German is terrible. And they were great to read. And I think he deserves all the credit that he should deserve. Absolutely. So I don't think it's so monolithic. I mean, I know it's hard. You're the only Friedman person here, so you have to fight everybody else to get your voice heard. But it's, it's a fair argument, David. Which brings up the question, when is enough credit enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer that. that. Artists, <laughs> <the> artists <laughs> answer that. I, I have to say something as the artist here, and perhaps sitting in a parallel universe, and one of writing is for everybody else. Um, but I think there's some really interesting issues being raised here. The idea of convergence is an interesting one, too. First of all, we have to define what you mean by that, because does that mean commonality of point of view? Or does it mean the opportunity to interact? And I think that's the more important part. And the, the, um, the, the opportunity to correct each other, look at each other's um, practices and uh, professions, and uh, apply skepticism there is really important. The other thing I'd say is that um, you can't avoid the socio-political sort of uh, context of science. And you can look at the, the hard science itself, but then everything that's happening is happening in this broader context. One of the things we're talking about is this idea of a kind of critical reflexivity. And it's interesting to hook on the computer and have an instant feedback. And I'd say that that notion of that context of critical reflexivity is not only expanding, it's accelerating. And you know, the rate of change and the rate of reflexivity will probably escalate. And that's probably a very healthy thing in some ways. Credit is a really interesting context. It doesn't matter whether you're in art or any area of activity. But you know, if you go and see a big film, and that's what a lot of it is now, if you think of the, the Hubble telescope or the Mars mission or whatever it is, it's a big, it's a big movie. And when you get to the credits at the end, they're phenomenal. Most people have left the theater at that point. <laughs> 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 but some people some people stay at the end. Just su su suggest we end with that because then we will have begun yeah. and end with our artists, which I think is a great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's 5:25. <laughs> I think it's great. That's so. Good. <laughs>